Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show, uh, January the 11th. Wow. Uh, Wednesday already. In my studio here is senior correspondent Scott Morell. Scott, how are you today? Great. I feel like a Yankee doodle dandy. Wow. That's, uh, you never felt like that before, I know. Scott. And have you heard that in recent uh, times? Anyone describing themselves like that? Never heard it. Okay. Great description, Scott. You're going to have to get into more detail uh, after I introduce Rhea. As we go across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, we go over to the UK, uh, Milton Keynes, uh, where Rhea lives. Rhea Bo, senior correspondent. Uh, it's for you, Rhea. It's good afternoon to you, Rhea Bo. Hi, Dean. Hi, Scott. Hi, lovely listeners. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm a bit under the weather today, so I might sound as though I've had a cold, but I've been really rather poorly. Um, but I'm just about with it enough to, to do a show. But um, today's show is led by our lovely Scott Morell, and the topic is gadgets we can do without. We may touch on some other subjects as well, maybe a quick catch up. But outside of that, it's gadgets we can do without out is the topic of the show and until then back to you dean thank you ria Bo. scott let's go over to you uh regarding uh this whole area of got gadgets i know uh you uh you had mentioned i know it was fascinating that uh, just recently this week there was the huge uh, consumer technology show that took ba- place in las vegas and i think uh i think in june uh, there's one in shanghai i don't know if you're making the uh i don't know if you're making the tri- trip to shanghai that seems like a trip that you would make but you seem to be uh fascinated by this whole area of what's uh what's coming out with gadgets that's good and what's coming out with gadgets that's bad. So uh, what do you have to share with us today? Well, uh, as we all know, technology is racing along faster than our culture and our human development. And uh, as such, uh, gadgets are going sort of in the same place. And we are such a consumer-centric society that we feel that we need to have the next gadget Uh, whether or not we really need it. It just looks cool and wow. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the Consumer Electronics Show, Dean, that you just mentioned that was in Las Vegas. And there was a reporter there. And many of the exhibits that were there last year were no longer there. Hmm. Um, Many. And so they were out of business in one year. And this year they were focusing on drones. So there was a whole, you know, area of the conference area room that was about drones, and when he looked at a lot of these drones, there was only two, two of maybe 100 companies that he thinks is going to be back next year. Most of them are very lightweight plastic toys. One person said, well, where would I find this? And it was, a, it was an older man, a gentleman, who says, you would find it in the, warm, in the toy section at Walmart. Now, why would a man walk in the toy section a Walmart to find a drone. He wouldn't. Right, exactly. So even the business concepts to a lot of these gadgets are just getting out of hand. So that's just a little... Scott, I'm going to act naive, okay? Sure. Um, You really got to educate me a little bit more on really uh, exactly what a drone is. And there might be people in our audience even that uh, need some background on drone. Can you help? Sure. You know, when I was young... um, not, you know, young or relatively younger. I remember there used to be um, these toy helicopters. Do you remember that at, I, at Toys yeah, R Us? I I yeah, it was kind of fun. It, I, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between a drone and a toy helicopter. They're both radio remote control items. And, you know, the concept of it originally was, well, you know, they could go higher. You could put some, um, uh, what is it called, the gobo, whatever the video is, so you could take a look. You know, you have spying issues. You have FAA issues interfering on the pilot, so I can understand that. Um, and I'm not quite sure the need for drones, except for the fact that there are some companies that can be more sophisticated. Again, the cream rises to the, cro- to the top. So, for instance, Amazon has been uh, trying out 
for the last two years to have drone deliveries. Mm. Um, and it sounds kind of interesting, although right now I have Amazon Fresh. I order, th- you know, six o'clock in the morning, stare at five. You know, a truck works. And where are they going to land these things? I just think this whole drone um, phenomena is really going to fade away like the toy helicopter. And I, I just see this as a, one example of many examples of gadgets do we really need? And maybe down the line they'll find something, but everyone is, it's, everyone um, flows to certain gadgets and then it becomes overexposed and then people lose a lot of money. I remember in my youth, it was the, if you remember, you, you remember the paper planes? Yes. When you had to put the cardboard, you know, you had to put the wings through the, the uh, balsa through the wood? Yeah. Oh, you know, was that unbelievable? Loved it. <laughs> You just went like this. I remember that. That's a good one. To, I don't think they had a uh, helicopter. It was uh, it was strictly back in uh, our early days. The airplane, yes. Or you take a piece of paper, yes. Of course, you, you folded you it. You fold it and you make your own right. uh, paper plane. I gotta go. I gotta go over to Ria. Did she ever do that in her youth? Ria, come on, be honest. Did you ever make? Uh, did you ever? Do you remember those cardboard uh, planes that you put the wings through? Or if you didn't have a cardboard plane, you uh, took a piece of paper and made your own plane i did i think yeah i try i could do a basic one but i I couldn't do a posh one sort of like a concord looking one which the boys could do but i do remember that but that was not kind of a for sale thing you just made it out of a piece of paper didn't you yeah i guess i guess once again our cultures are very different that uh in your youth i guess that wasn't a big british thing to do huh um no not uh (laughs) Maybe for the boys. I don't know, Dean. Well, Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, there's another thing. First of all, we don't have paper to do that anymore. So we got rid of all the paper. <laughs> but one thing I did with paper, Dean, I don't know. You might want to be um, very honest to our audience right now. One thing I did do with paper and a straw is when I was at the back of the classroom, I used to do the spitball. I hate to you tell did you. That. I did you it. did that. Yes, I did. I was a bad, bo- a bad boy at that time. I'll bet you didn't just do that in, uh, in in school. I'll bet you that you did it in Hebrew school as well. Absolutely. Because those were boring days. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Those were the two schools. Uh, I stopped in college. I used oh, my to, God. I think I told that to Rabbi <laughs> Mendy Goldberg when he was in here, that uh, Hebrew school. It's true. Hebrew school growing up, <laughs> when, my, when my dad used to drive me to Hebrew, Hebrew school on Sundays, and I used to stay, you know, an Orthodox temple. <laughs> Me too. I used to stay there for like four hours. Torture. I mean, it, it, it was just Sorry, so, Mindy. so boring. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I used to do spitballs more through a straw <laughs> yes. in Hebrew school yes. than I did it in uh, regular public school. Did you sometimes uh, hit the teacher yeah. <laughs> when she was going to the blackboard? <laughs> Not only that, but I used to aim for the yarmulke. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let's go back over to Ria. I don't know if Ria knows what a yarmulke is. Ria, do you know what a yarmulke is? Um, no, not really. I didn't attend Jewish school. You know, it's the skull cap. It's the skull cap that's worn. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. a yarmulke. If you had a sufficiently a uh, fast spitball without a paper clip on the yarmulke, <laughs> it could. If you direct it properly, it could take off the yarmulke. It was a source of joy and fun. Okay, Scott, this is turning into a comedy show. Yes, it is. Well, listen. Hey, listen. It's free-flowing, as you said, Dean. Free-flowing, spontaneous, and and we keep it real, right? (laughs) (laughs) This is really real. It's all yours, Scott. Yeah, I mean, mean, just other things. You know, there's something called Alexa right now that's from Amazon.com, and it's getting a whole bunch of uh, reviews and stories. Actually, um, the FBI wants to grab it. There was a murder, and there's a slim chance that anything's on it, but this 60 seconds of recording and uh, Amazon does not want to give it to the FBI and it's just you know I'm watching these commercials I'm, I'm watching I'm going to Amazon hi Alexa um, what's the weather today and I'm kind of saying hey jerk why don't you just take a look out your window or go to your smartphone and find out if it's 52 degrees and if it's raining or not now that's how I would respond if I was Alexa do we really need to have these faux personal assistants in our house um Hey, Alexa, turn on the TV. Is it very difficult to take a remote control and put it on? I mean, what is the real benefit to this burgeoning industry? I'm going to give this to Rhea now, and then I want to hear from you, Dean. <laughs> oh, okay. It's a bit of a difficult one, really. I mean, uh, what, how do I add to this? Um, let me see. Well, originally, the mainframe Internet 2.0 was about connecting people. 
and they pulled that off over about a seven year period and it went to internet 3.0 the base model uh, was about connecting things right so you can control your um, house from your phone the heating and whatever you need to control everything's going to come with an IP address so your refrigerator can talk to a central unit your phone will know when um, it's running uh, when the car's running low on oil everything so this is the stage that is at in terms of the infrastructure is the internet of things that's where we're at at the moment in terms of a bigger view but the two big acronyms that are not really in the domestic area at the moment are AI and VR and they're not quite ready to go in the public domain hence we've got all these kind of toy robot things and uh, plastic drones that are well not all that for the kids aren't they um, I think it's what you're saying uh, Scott is there, there haven't been really many good adult toys for someone like yourself. Is that right? Uh, sort of. Or um, or um, gadgets that could go throughout the whole course of every age group um, that would be added a value rather than just a gimmick or a toy. Um, so I think both, Rhea. Rhea went way over my head with this AIE, this oh, IEC um, and yes, A I, and B. She's got to help me with that. I can uh, tell you. It went right. You're going to help me. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. AI is artificial intelligence and VR is virtual reality. Is that correct, Rhea? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, VR is a big thing. Um, it's going through a set of standards at the moment as to what is acceptable and what is not because because of advertising and there's some dark forces at work within the advertising and corporate world, when you step into a, a virtual reality world, there's subliminal advertising and subliminal, subliminal messaging. Excuse me. And they're having to keep an eye on that. But they're the two next big things, AR, AI and VR. Scott. Yeah, well, let me bring up two points uh, that I'm so happy that you brought up. You're so, you know, you you, you answer a question and then um, create uh, another question, which is great. Um, with the Internet 3.0, with security issues, I think there is going to be security issues for these smart homes. And we're being hacked constantly by foreign entities. We know about the Russians, the Chinese, and, uh, and so forth. Um, could you imagine, um, you know, a hack where, um, you know, they're turning off everything in your house? I saw movies recently, um, you know, and that could be extremely disruptive. The more we use these technologies the more we are slaves to them i could tell you when i leave the house and i don't have my phone on me um i can't function for the day it it, it, it because i relied on it for everything now 15 years ago you would just leave the house so the more you use it the more you are reliant the more there's going to be um you know bad people or bad actors trying to disrupt our democracies. Um, and the other thing I, w I wanted to discuss, which just to follow up with you, is I, it's interesting about the subliminal advertising with virtual reality. I don't know if you realize, Dean, um, I, I was told this back in the early days, um, that when you had the motion picture in the film, what they would do is you could not see it with your eyes, but it, it was so quick, the frame, that they would put Coca-Cola right in there but you couldn't see it. Hmm. And that was a big story back then. I'm talking about the 70s and 80s. That's where it really started. Rhea, are you familiar with that at all? I'll, then I'll go to Dean on that. I hope Rhea's familiar yeah, with it because I'm not familiar with okay. it. Okay, Go ahead, Rhea. Yeah, no, I am familiar with it, yeah. And that's what you want to say about it. <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> speaking as well, so I was trying to get out of the way. No, no, Dean, um, Dean wasn't going to... Uh, Add much. That's what he. I think he was implying. So you could go on a little bit more. Okay. Well, back in the day, when they, when I think when you're bringing it into question, when they were doing this, it was about frame rates. They put in one frame, didn't they? Exactly so right. As a, as a roll of film went round, and you was watching a movie, one frame would just say Coca Cola, and it was just very quick. And it's like flashcards. You can put something into somebody's head. Sometimes they realise. But there's no resistance because of the, the frame rate in which it goes in. And then the advertising authorities came along and said they gave limits to the amount of time, minimum time that you could actually place as some kind of advertising, if that helps, Scott. Yeah. 
Uh, what, do you, what do you feel about the technology and wearables, where it's going? A lot of the wearables, a lot of the watches are going out of business. I mean, I have an Apple Watch, but it's not only, you know, to do, you know, my exercise. It has other functions. And frankly, it's a gadget. I could do without it. Uh, where do you think that technology is going? Um, well, I think people just like to buy things. I think they intrinsically want to consume because of an emptiness in their lives. So they buy whatever the latest fashion is and then i guess if it supplies a something then it stays if it doesn't i guess it eventually falls comes off your wrist and away you go um there, there's a company that's well you know google glasses don't you scott yes i do well that that's going to be the next big thing it's going to be within the glasses and they can measure brain waves and everything which is already developed and kind of ready to go which is an amazing thing but the gadgets thing appears on the surface to run a, it's run a little bit of his course isn't it yes um it, it just it brought it out too much and everything is a gadget also like you know the apps i have a lot of good apps i have a subway app uh you know my banking app you know but you're scrolling through all the apps i think the next um wave will be an app that has multi-functions to it so you don't have to have all these um subdivided apps what do you think about that they're all kind of re trying to reinvent the wheel. I think the bulk of the work has been done and the, the phone is, is pro probably the most powerful thing, isn't it? Because it's on your person. And I don't think the market is driven that hard in terms of funding because the, the state sponsorship were, were fully behind the internet connecting everybody because they can keep an eye on everybody. And it's a fundamental player. I mean, Microsoft and the NSA are almost like the same thing and things like that. So I think whenever my, where do I go myself? It's about risk rewards. If you feel that you attach your home by electronic means, so you want to know what your car's doing on your phone and your house, add, you know, measure the risk and measure the reward, you know, and see if it's worth uh, participating in because it may make you too vulnerable to um, attacks or something like that, Scott. And, and, and the last point, and then I think we're going to pivot after this, is that um, besides the security risks, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm guilty of all these things also. I have um, a drop cam in my house so I can watch my dog. I have some other things. And since you have them, um, you na naturally want to use them. And what happens is you lose that, again, that sense of living the moment, being with a person. And you, 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 it's, it's like a game. So you're sitting at a restaurant and, and you're looking at your dog. Uh, do you really have to do that? Um, and you're doing so many other things that are so unnecessary. And I think the more apps we have, the more excuses we have to, the, to go to the phone and the less social, socialization we have. And I think that's going to hurt our society in communication. That's just a little adjunct to it. So I wanted to add to it. But um, I think we talked about the gadget. I thought I just wanted to bring that up if it's a force of good or bad and, you know, what what's necessary and what's not. Dean, do you want to you know, uh, discuss things? I'm listening to what you and Rhea have to say, and you're talking about gadgets, and you're specifically talking about uh, phones and watches. I know that once I had my very first cell phone, uh, once I had my cell phone, I dropped all my watches. I never wore a watch again, and I don't wear one to date. You know, I'm able to get the time off my... So as far as fashion, that wasn't important to me to still continue to... Uh, to um, to continue to wear a watch. I gave all my watches to my son, Jared. So uh, no more watches anymore. And as far as the phone, I mean, it's been addictive. I mean, now I see what people go through. And, right. and now with the show, now doing uh, the radio show, it's, uh, you know, I'm constantly, constantly on it. It's driving my wife, Sharon, nuts. It's driving her nuts so much that there's two gadgets that have been around for years <laughs> that Sharon, Sharon's bugging me to get. Uh, one is uh, when it becomes winter here, she still doesn't understand with her A8 Audi, her 8, 8L Audi. She doesn't understand why she can't start her car from the house. So it warms up before she gets out there. So she always sends me out to start the car in the morning. Right. She wants that gadget. The second okay. thing is, you know, this this snowstorm we had out here, we had more snow than anyone. anyone you said you got hit the, the hardest. We had like a 10, 10 to 12 inches. Yeah, uh, 10, 12. You know, she still hit me with, uh, she wants the gadget that we should have heated driveways. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> Did you tell her there'll be a very big cost uh, yeah. expense to that? Keep in mind, Scott, we've been in this house now for uh, 28 years, you know? Yes, but you have a long driveway. That's going to so be quite just, a just, like my, a, yeah. just my guest to the show yesterday, I walked out, had a guest uh, escort her in to make sure she didn't uh, fall back on the uh, the black ice on the on the driveway. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we do have thermal floors that people heat their house with thermal floors. I know a few people, and it's very efficient. I don't know if you could use that same technology with blacktop. <laughs> <laughs> Rhea, do you have a heated driveway? <laughs> <laughs> I got a bet for you. Scott looks like I'll give that you a, was a, I'll that give was you a good one. Huh? I'll give you a fifty to one. Okay, fifty to one. It's my, my dollar for you. A fifty. She says no. Rhea, Rhea what's, do you, what's do you have a heated driveway, Rhea? Uh, can we do shares on the reward if I say yes? <laughs> you got to be honest. I'm going out there. I, I, I'm risking a dollar for fifty on this one. I've got about as much chance of having a heated driveway <laughs> as I have as ha- having a heated toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Rhea, I think you're in heat all the time, Rhea. <laughs> I think you're a pretty hot woman. Absolutely. <laughs> She's quiet right now, very quiet, eerily quiet. Um so well, we'll I had to make that sure. up I had to make that up to her. You know, I, I talked I, I said to you know, I, I promised over the shows never to talk over to Rhea. And I did that once already today. So I had to give her that good plug just now. Right. Okay? Because she's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's so much happening in the world. Uh, I think we should uh, transition to what we've experienced this week in the world between politics and geopolitics. And uh, Rhea, uh, you're our geopolitical expert in uh, world affairs. <laughs> what we, You are. Um, what, what caught your fancy this week? Oh, what's caught my fancy? Well, we was going to do the news tomorrow, so I haven't really prepared as quite okay. a lot of information. I can do a casual thing, though, because um, I've been poorly and I was bedridden for a couple of days, so I was out the loop. I haven't spoke to friends that I usually speak to and everything like that. When I come back to the land of the living, just, although well, I could have been accused of being a zombie, I must say, <laughs> I, I woke up to all the US troops landing in Europe, uh, Brevenhaven, um, uh, can you remember when I report? I uh, reported on a week ago about four thousand troops coming out of Fort Carson, and along with ten thousand support, well, they've all arrived in Germany, and they're um, infiltrating Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. So now the east coast of Russia is entirely encased in U.S. troops, and NATO has a. Uh, put on high alert and mobilize 300,000 troops to also go on the border. So um, maybe start with that one. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's perfect. I've been following that, actually. Uh, it's costing us between 3 and $4 billion to mobilize all those troops. Uh, these are the first tanks that we've had in Poland, you know, the Baltic states in, in like 10 or 20 years. And it's obviously a show of force with Putin that um, don't mess with NATO and don't think you're going to have a free ride to come into these countries. You'll be met with force. Hmm. Wow. It's that big, three to four billion, huh, Scott? Yep. Wow. So I, I think that's serious. And, uh, you know, today uh, Rex Tillerson has been on the hot seat for the uh, Senate confirmations and his views on Russia. It's been really, really been fascinating hearing both Republican and Democratic questions about, you know, whether sanctions work, uh, military force, what's his relationships with Putin, um, did he, is he a war criminal or not? He really dodged that one, which both Republicans and Democrats thought was amazing. Uh, they also said was amazing is that he had meetings with Trump and they talked about, so what you talk about, and they talked about some broad things. So one of the senators said, I assume you talked about Trump about Russia. He says, no, we didn't get to that. And then the senator said, amazing. Um, so, you know, this is a big issue. And they talked about war crimes, you know, because of the Syria bombings on hospitals and children um, and, uh, you know, going to Crimea, Crimea uh, Eastern Ukraine, Georgia, and uh, shooting um, dissidents and journalists. Would you consider him a war criminal? And Rex Tillerson would not answer that question. He said he does not have enough um, private intelligence. And the senators uh, uh, came back with, well, there's overwhelming public intelligence that's out in the open that uh, just the regular layman could determine that. Uh, Why do you need the private intelligence? And he wouldn't say that. And that's going to be, honestly, it's just keeping up this concept that what, what, 
are they protecting with Russia? Is it Exxon? Is it um, the meddling with Russia, with, with the United States election? And the big question, I think that's going to come out very, very soon. And there was a bombshell that a lot of people are disputing. It came out last night that Russia has information on Trump that will compromise Trump. I don't know if you saw that last night. I did see it, Scott, but uh, it seems like uh, whatever mainstream news I put on, it seems like there's constant uh, tweets uh, by the president-elect that uh, the the standard statement is, uh, once again, fake news is continuing. Yeah, but he also trusts Assange over the um, 17 intelligence agencies. I, I, I I don't buy what he's saying. What I think is, honestly, and I hope it's not true, I really hope, but I think he's being duped. Um, Vladimir Putin, as much as they don't like him, he's a genius. He's a he's a KGB operative. Um, he's much more advanced than Obama or Trump in espionage. This guy knows how to do it, and I think he's playing Trump right now. And it's not really looking good. And and both sides of the aisle are alienating him. You basically have ninety nine or hundred senators that want to have more sanctions. He's mm-hmm. standing alone in this in this ocean. And uh, it's very concerning right now that he was so pro pro Russia, and doesn't you know wants to have this reset. And maybe it's ideological, it's, it's goodwill. But now, what happens if if they really have the goods on him? What happens? You know, the day before inauguration, or maybe three weeks after, and a bombshell comes out. What do we do? It's just a question. Uh, Scott, Rhea, let me, before I go over to you, uh, let me just express that, you know, when Scott walks into the house and getting ready into the studio, I know he's uh, one of many that uh, as we get close to an inauguration day, that it's just uh, really hitting him in his uh, tremendous uh, stomach uh, stomach duress that uh, happens with him every day with uh, who our president-elect is. And uh, where my, my, my feelings and thought process is we held an election. Uh, someone has won. Uh, he is the president-elect. And, uh, you know, as far as my feelings are, nothing's going to change that. He's going to be the president of the United States. And uh, uh, this is not about, uh, you know, pro-Trump, negative Trump. This is about uh, just me saying this this man's going to be president of the United States and uh, let's see how he executes and uh, what happens. I'm not sitting back and criticizing and beating him up. Uh, the process has been done here in this country and uh, he's going to be uh, in very soon president of the United States. So uh, Scott is, I know, very consumed in this. And what's so unique is that we've got this great show to be able to have a platform and to air out our feelings and discuss it. And I want Scott to be able to continue to do that here. But at this point, I want to go back over to you and up to this point with Scott. How do you feel about what he said so far? Um, Well, keeping it sort of on the move somewhat, if you'd imagined everything that Scott said, and I would say entirely the opposite, that might give you some idea. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't see it like that at all. So, but rather, we've been into this a few times, haven't we? And people are entitled to their own views. I don't share Scott's. So, but I do have some other news. So we'll just keep it moving forward and um, get it, uh, just move it on one of the topics that you brought up. Sure. There's there's been a... um, there's a website out there called J20 that is organizing far left groups planning to cause chaos at the inauguration on the 20th. Um, people are calling it an act of terrorism. And because uh, the terror, according to Black's Law Dictionary, it is terrorism, uh, which is basically the use or threat of violence to intimidate or cause panic, especially as a means of affecting political conduct. And this website is up and running and asking people to join it to go and cause chaos at the inauguration. Wow. So where are your thoughts with that, guys? That's fascinating, Rhea. That's, Scott, what's your thought on that? That's, that's, not unbelievable. Good. that's unbelievable. I don't agree with it. I, 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 I don't agree what they're doing. I, I knew you wouldn't agree to it. No, absolutely but, not. Uh, it's, it's, your, it's your turn. Go yeah, ahead. No, I don't, no what, I'm, what I'm saying is th- this is a horrible website. Um, I don't agree on any uh, part of terrorism, you know, he uh, just like you said, he is our president. I have a lot of concerns, and he's duly elected. But um, I don't know if that's the same thing, Ria, as the women march the next day, because I know a lot of people that are going to it. Is this different? 
Um, yeah, sorry. No, it's completely different. Uh, no, this is purely just to upset the apple cart for ignoration. And is there an ethnic group or racial group that um, is uh, uh, advocating this or it's just um, disaffected um, um, voters that are against Trump? Oh, one would assume disaffected voters, I guess. Um, that these are lots of different groups and this is a funded thing. So this is not just, you know, a, a, a 20 cent website. This is this is an organized affair, Scott. So it's called J20, is that correct, Ria? Uh, yeah, J20 website. It's called, there's one called J20, one called iPatriots. And they're um, trying to collect people to create a, a massive problem on the inauguration at the inauguration. What, 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 do you have any idea of what type of problems they're going to try? Are they going to say bomb? Are they going to say vulgarities? Are they going to loot? Do they describe the manner uh, and the execution of their quote unquote terror? I haven't got that far. It's about, I come across this about two weeks ago. I didn't bring it up because there was other news that I felt was not as important, but I would bring it up closer to the date. Um, okay. And so I don't know, but it's it's a pretty ugly thing. And it was just to give people a heads up that there's a far left group and they're looking to get into it. If you was um, interested in knowing more, I've put a YouTube video up on the wiki vid.com uh, YouTube channel and it will say a uh, far left group planning um, terrorism on the day of inauguration if you did want to know more because that guy that's speaking about it knows a lot more about well, it well that's pretty scary Ria <laughs> very yeah, it's scary. Pretty scary it's kind of scary right we're ready to move on to some new stuff Absolutely. please very excited uh, I picked up some stats about um, the U.S. forces and how many numbers are exactly sitting off the coast of China. Any ideas of the numbers that are sitting off, off the coast of China, guys? Uh, no, US, you, uh, that's including uh, people stay, uh, um, only on boats or on land also? Yeah, 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 just at sea. Okay, I would say, I would say 100,000. Okay, so it's what we've got. I got the stats out. Um, these were released about two and a half weeks ago, and I wanted to leave. This was a public announcement. I wanted to leave it because when I heard the numbers, I was quite shocked. But I wanted to leave it because if it turned out to be false, w within a day, maybe two, we would know that it was false. There's been no backlash from the public announcement. So I I'm using that as to sort of validate the numbers. But so for off the coast of China, and India as well, as well as the Philippines. There's 200 battleships. Wow. There's 1,540 fighter jets, 360,000 troops with a drone fleet just been deployed last week to join them. Wow, those are amazing uh, numbers, Ria. They're big, aren't they? Big, huge. Why, why, why are they off the coast of India? We don't have any issues with India. Well, no, if you have a look, you've got B-52s flying across the north coast of China. You've got all the troops just arrived into Europe to encase the east coast of Russia. And now you've encased, um, you, you've basically nearly encased the whole continent with troops and destroyers and the like. Oh, so they're so, doing a 360. So off the coast of India is going to the southern flank of Russia. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Southern and the flank of Russia. Um, so it looks as though you guys sort of are, are keen to get stuck into Russia at some point. Um, so there was a few facts for you. I found another law as well in California, SB 1322. Uh, it's just gone through. Minors, um, this isn't for kids, minors under the age of 18 can no longer be prosecuted for selling sex. Wow. Wow. Think about that. Just breathe that in a second. I'm breathing it. I'm breathing it. That's wait, a bit wait. scary. Scott, right? are you breathing it? Oh, you know, I'm so stupid. I thought miners, when she started, was coal miners. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, sometimes I don't have it all today. Okay, so that one, I, 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 I give me a mulligan. So now let me understand. People under the age of 18, not coal miners, can no longer be prosecuted for what? For... Se selling sex. Selling sex. Um, in California. 
So a 17-year-old girl that wants to be a prostitute and make a living, that's now legal? I didn't say that. It's SB 1322 in California's minors under the age of 18 can no longer be prosecuted for selling sex. So the hypothetical that I just mentioned, would that fall under that provision? Imply. Wow. Yes. That is, okay. that, that's terrible. As a matter of fact, I'm, that's I'm, awful. I, I'm, as a matter of fact, just you know, I'm a libertarian. I believe anyone over probably 21, not 18, um, prostitution should be le- legal. Um, it's safer. It goes on no matter what, and it should be taxed and Wait, regulated. Wait, can you say that again? Oh, absolutely. Say that again. I want to hear that. I'm a libertarian. I okay. believe that anything uh, in America, if I want to do it, and it doesn't, Dean, it doesn't affect you directly. I should be able to do it. That's that's life, liberty, and property, liberty. And libertarians believe, for instance, euthanasia should be legal, um, prostitution should le- be legal, drugs uh, should be legal and regulated, because we all know, um, as long as there's a demand, uh, you're going to get the drugs, and all you're going to have is crime and non-taxable things and all these other uh, horrible um, manif- manif- manifestations. So I'm a true libertarian. So I believe in prostitution being legalized. It is legalized, by the way, in, in the outer counties of Las Vegas. And it works like a charm, and it's run by the federal government. So, um, and, and Colorado's doing marijuana, and it's, it's going. So all these, I call them puritanical laws, these blue laws that came from <clears throat> the English, um, we, we should really um, Americanize. And as long as it doesn't affect you, wow. I should be able to do it. Rhea, do you, uh, do you agree with Scott's opinion on that? Um, I was just going to do a disclaimer, actually. Scott Morel. <laughs> <laughs> let me hear it. I, I threw the British in. I knew, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but let me hear it. I was just going to say, uh, the views of Scott Morel are not necessarily shared by <laughs> the Blackman Show. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And we all have uh, our free minds. So I, I have to start uh, future shows with Scott. I have to start doing a show disclaimer in the yes, future. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Right, well, okay, so... They're, they're individual views. People should be able to have their individual views. Yes, right, absolutely. Moving, let's go on to another one. Right? Okay. So it's just to bring news to the people. And I wasn't prepared for this, and I'm poorly, so I'm not on form. Right, here's another one. Uh, New York Post reports. Washington Post has retracted another fake story about Vermont power station being shut down by the Russians. You know about that, don't you? The, the what station? You know the Vermont Power Station? Yes, I know all about that, that they retracted the Washington Post. Yeah, okay, so you've got that one. And we've got another one where the news is just coming out of the U.S. where you're running out of farmers. So, you know my view on GM food. I think it's a a really stupid way to go, but hey, it is what it is. But in turn, because it's a predator crop, because you get the crop and the herbicide with it that kills not normal stuff. I know it kills, yeah, it kills nature but not their gm stuff the u.s is running out of farmers because if they go to farm something because it's been signed into law with monsanto and bayer that they are uh, allowed to produce these gm crops if a farmer starts a crop say of um, a million hectares and there's a, a gm crop next to it the gm crop will take over the farmer's own crop well, when he comes to take that to yield, Monsanto is coming along, checking the crop. And if the DNA is shared within the GM product, that crop then belongs to Monsanto. Wow. And yes. Because of this, and because of this, farmers are going, well, what's the point in farming? So you'll soon, if it carries on where like, which there is every sign that it will, you will have no farmers and you will be able to be held ransom with food hmm. Hmm. that is that is terrible and we did have a episode about that um and it's really not fair because these things can be blown to the next hectare and now you have these gen- genetic um uh, mater- uh, you know codes that are now part of your plants and now the only way to replant is to uh, gain a license i think what you said from monsanto and therefore they are now owning your farm is that something is that sort of correct Rhea? they don't own the farm they own the crop that's what that i meant use. right yeah they they will own the crop because what they're doing they're sending their agents of darkness up take a sample if that holds that dna that modified dna that is monsanto crop 
So and it's a, and they know it's a predator crop. So again, it's another rigged race. But let me ask but, you something, Ria. If um, I'm growing a tomato on on a farm next to a GMO farm, and uh, I'm a tomato farmer, and you know, based on the sprays and the GMOs um, and the winds, it affects my tomatoes, and I have some, you know, GMOs in there. Are you saying? It was against my will. I did not engage with Monsanto. Are you saying that because there's a um, a genetic change in in that, I now am a, a, a incumbent or a slave to GMO? Uh, sorry, sorry to Monsanto, and I cannot grow my own uh, tomatoes without paying Monsanto. Correct. Hmm. That's wow. terrible. Wow, that's awful. Well, they've got the patent on it. They were able, on one hand, when they went to get the patent for the modified DNA and RNA, um, they were saying to the patent office, that look, it's not that different. Give us the patent. They got the patent through lobbying the revolving door thing. But then as soon as the farmer goes to produce it, say your tomatoes, if that's got that Monsanto DNA in it, that belongs to Monsanto. But Ria... I can understand if I'm a client of Monsanto and I say, listen, I, I like the GMOs, um, uh, the yield is better, I'm going to make a deal with, with Monsanto, but now I'm the other farmer next door, I don't want anything to do Monsanto. Are you saying that I have no choice because um, of the movement through wind and so forth that my pure crop of tomato tomatoes is now infected, I therefore... Um, have to now um, pay Monsanto for the privilege of making that new tomato, even though I'd never engaged with Monsanto. Correct. That is terrible. How can that be? We spoke about this in a program ages ago. I you know. didn't seem too bothered. No, I, I just, uh, you know, I guess I'm getting more outraged as we talk about it. Uh, Ria, how, no, long, how long has Monsanto had this uh, patent? Uh, it was, I think it was done during the Reagan administration. Wow, it's that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hawaii is the test bed. Scott, it's, and, ama- it's just amazing as time goes on each show how much more we learn from Rhea. No, no, it's, it is. And what lobbying group, so I know, has been the force to change congressmen? And do you, and do you know which uh, political side has been really um, on Monsanto's side? I gave you guys a video to watch. I don't know whether you was part of it at the time, but I gave you a video to watch. If you go to Wicked Vid, go down the controversial page, you'll see a Monsanto one and you'll learn all about it and how it comes about. And they interview farmers. So you know your tomato crop, Scott? Yes. Your, your hypothetical tomato crop. They interview people that are not hypothetical, and that very thing has happened to. They take Monsanto to court, and they just haven't won because Reagan allowed a, a predator crop to be signed off along with the Roundup um, that goes with it, and the two go hand in hand, That's and they just it's just taken over everything. You terrible. Don't, you don't have your own crop of tomatoes in Long Island City, do you? No, I don't. No, no. I don't even have um, a cucumber garden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so move, it, move it along, Rhea. Okay, here we go. I got some numbers on um, more military stuff. Excuse me, I'm going to cough, so I'm going to mute. Right, fortunately, I have a mute button. That's good. Um, special forces surge in Africa, US special forces. In 2006, just 1% of commandos sent overseas were deployed in the US Africa command area of operations. Just Listen to that again. In 2006, just 1% of commandos sent overseas were deployed in the U.S. Africa Command Area of Operations, whatever that is. In 2016, this has gone up to 17.26% of all U.S. Special Operation Forces, including Navy SEALs, Green Berets amongst them deployed abroad was sent to Africa according to data supplied by the Intercept by the US Special Operations Commander in total ranks second only to the Middle East. So there's more um, military in Africa the, the only the only place where there's more military is in the Middle East. There's a massive build-up of forces in Africa. Back to you guys. Wow. Well um, I, I did hear that um, Ria and um, you know 
we don't talk a lot about Africa, at least in the United States, I think probably more in, in Europe and the UK. And it's, it's sort of a forgotten country. And there's totally corrupt regimes there. And it's ripe for terrorism. And I think it's more of a preventive action. So Africa um, does not become the new Middle East for Boko Haram and other terrorist organizations. So I'm not quite sure if I'm upset about that. I agree with you, Scott. There's very little here in the States that you see on Africa. Is that uh, is that the way it is uh, in Europe, Maria? Uh, generally so. You've got occupation of about 37 out of the 52 countries. And there's major goings on in the Central African Republic, um, Ethiopia, South Sudan is, because South Sudan's got oil. Um, and around that edge corner, of, on one side you've got Yemen of the Red Sea, and on the other side you've got Ethiopia and the South Sudan. So there's loads of private forces in there as well. So that, that's it really. I just wanted to raise awareness that um, there is there is escalating U.S. military in Africa to the tune of 37 countries out of the 52. So I'll move on a bit. This will be up your street. Um, make you chuckle maybe a little bit. Trump places personal invitation to Benjamin Netanyahu to attend his inauguration. <laughs> wow. Yes, I, I heard That's that. That's terrific. I'm glad to hear that. Well, that is a thumb in the nose to Obama. I'm glad and, to hear that. And just like uh, when um, the U.S. Congress during the Iran negotiations invited Netanyahu to speak in a joint session of Congress, um, there really is a, a big divide between Netanyahu and Obama. So I think, you know, it really, it, it, this is just a get even type of thing. Scott, listen, I've, we've, you and I have had much conversation over this. Um, Listen, I uh, I've had uh, I've had respect for um, President Obama, uh, the first lady, his family uh, held himself in tremendous class over the last eight years. Uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, how I feel about how he executed politically uh, for this uh, country. But uh, no matter what your feelings are, no matter what anyone's feelings are politically, about Prime Minister, about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu or about Israel, uh, I was shocked. I was appalled. I was extremely disappointed in our U.S. president that uh, uh, with his with his position that he took a couple of weeks ago uh, on Israel. I was shocked, Scott. Just shocked. And uh, every U.S. president, every U.S. president should uh, be a tremendous. No matter what should be a tremendous ally of Israel. And and I, uh, unless you have something else to say, I'm just expressing my feelings uh, that in eight years, that was the bit with, with such a f couple of weeks left in his administration, he castrated me. That's the way I felt. He, he just cut me right by, you know, I was very disappointed. What's your feelings on it? Uh, just to say that the UN is the most bigoted um, institution in, in the uh in the planet um you know i think 19 out of 20 resolutions are against israel they have hospitals right now in the galilee that's helping syrian refugees it's just it's just it's so blatant and you don't hear a thing about uh you know syria and russia and china and uh you know myanmar and all these other countries that are committing war atrocities and we're talking about uh, apartment buildings in a disputed area um and uh you know there's arguments on both sides palestinians have their arguments uh, but the only way to um finally get peace is in my opinion my strong opinion is you need to first recognize the state of israel if you can't recognize that there will be a state there is no point in negotiation so there is first and there, there comes second and then i think israel then should stop the settlements but it's really an easy path and i just don't understand why obama did that just leave it to the next president i agree with you scott i just i just read that there is uh when he becomes uh just uh one of us after he leaves his presidency. Obama. Yeah, Obama. I hear that there's, uh, I even hear that there's a country club, a golf club that he wants to join somewhere in Maryland. I just uh, read this morning that uh, is thinking about not letting him even uh, uh, come into a club. That's shocking. Yeah. I, can ne I can't imagine not having a president being allowed in the club. Yep, yep. Wow. I read that, I think, somewhere online this morning. Wow. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, very odd things are happening at the conclusion of this presidency. And, um, you know, the next <laughs> 10 or 12 days are going to be very, very interesting, really. Iria, anything, anything to add on, on any of this? Oh, well, I was just going to move it along because you guys, yes. you know, you guys are the Jewish guys, so you'd what, have something to well, say. Well, what's, what's your feelings, uh, Ria, on what uh, Scott's position and then my strong position, uh, how I feel about uh, the position he took uh, with Israel? Who, Obama? Yeah. I think it's part of a larger plan, Dean. Okay. I don't see it. I mean, if you was you know, microscopic about it and looked at the single issue, there's no doubt it's just stirred the pot and caused a load of problems. Uh, f regardless of whether you're on a Palestinian point of view or a Jewish point of view, the state of Israel and so on. But either way, that measure alone has, has created another piece of the world that's not at peace. That's correct. Um, and that bothers me, you know, that's why I bring up this military stuff. When military is involved, they're not out giving out flower power from the 60s. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that it's not a nice thing. It's not a nice thing. But sometimes power so, has to be met with power. And Putin's having a run on, on the territories and he's being aggressive. I mean, we can't just sit still. Would you agree on that? Not necessarily. No, uh, no, I don't agree at all. I mean, oh. I realize that that is your point of view okay and here in europe we are far far more scared of the u.s forces than we are of russia make no mistake i realize it's not your view but i've been speak caught up with a few friends this morning and there's all the rallies going off along poland germany the eastern border trying to get the u.s forces out well that's not going to work but that they're trying their best to get rid of them because you know the death machine has just rolled into town. I heard. And I heard just the opposite. Geopolitically, geopolitically, we see where the U.S. have positioned themselves, and the world looking in do not see Russia on your borders. Um, and I, I'm sorry, Ria. Yeah, I, 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 okay, I, I've heard completely the opposite. In fact, McCain and Global. Uh, oh, it's it's Global hey, Char no, and you see what I'm getting into because. You know, you have your point of view. I, I know how I feel for one. I can speak for myself and I'm far more scared of your guys than I am a Russia. No, no, I, so I, I understand that. That those people, where those tanks have come into Brevin, that's only 300 miles from me. No, no, I understand that. What I'm, I, I, I believe what you feel maybe in in uh, Ireland and England and the Netherlands and France. But when you go east, um, McCain and Graham went on a tour during the Christmas break, and they are scared as can be. And and from what I've been told, unless they're lying, is that they are welcoming all you know this military presence because they're afraid Russia is going to invade them just like they invaded Ukraine. Ukraine. Is that is okay, that? Well, where, where's the evidence? The evidence is that they went into Ukraine and they and they annexed Crimea. So they just, no, it was the U.S. that went into the Ukraine and overturned the government. They it was a CIA black ops. Uh, well, you, it, I know you don't see it like that, but I can tell you, there's a lot of people that do. Well, uh, they they said that they said that. They said that, uh, well, that they, okay, one at one at a time, guys. One go, at a time. Go, go Ria, I'm sorry. What? Why would Russia want to go into the Ukraine? It's a basket case. What's it got to offer? Nothing. Well, I think it started. I think it started with this um, president uh, that was very, very pro-Russia, and they were concerned about that. Um, What's wrong with? I'm sorry. What's wrong with that? Well, no, there's nothing wrong with that except that if they, if he's not. Uh, if it's a, a democratically elected uh, country, uh, you have the right to dispose of someone, just like we have the right with a two-thirds majority to, to impeach Obama or Trump. Um, they have to ref we can't have foreign agents. And um, I guess he wasn't looking after their interests. And um, there was, I think, um, Russia fomented issues uh with the eastern part of ukraine with the russian-speaking populations but what was the purpose of russia going into a sovereign country and annexing crimea how can you defend that yeah well the, the problem is is all the news that i have and the news that you have is all second hands you would have to go to crimea and speak to the people to get a true reading on where Crimea stood. It's been an integral part of Russia for a long, long time. 
Then you so, ne- then you negotiate it. You don't annex it. You have discussions. No, no, and that's fair enough. But is it the U.S.'s job to police everything? Like I said, you're in seventy percent of the world's countries. That's a point. I, I, I would agree with that point. I, I think we have to pick and choose where we go. And right now, Russia is, uh, in, in, in the U.S. opinion, a threat, and North Korea is a threat. And I think we have to stay with those two areas right now and maybe work with other regional partners in the Mideast um, to um, try to take land away from ISIS. And those are the three areas. I, I don't think we should be everywhere. I agree with you. But we have to pick and choose. We can't be nowhere. You don't... Well, it's your call, you know, you, you do, you know, they do what they do and we have our point of view. But from what I see in the news that I take delivery of, uh, America is looking more and more like the, you know, the tentacles of the Roman Empire. Wow. It's an empire that's trying to, for sort of global dominance through an enormous military budget. And a lot of people see it like that. And you don't think that's a response to Russian uh, and Vladimir Putin's aggression? We, we don't just say, when, has he got, have you got Russian troops on your border? No, we don't. So what, what? That's the way the world sees it. The world looks in and goes, well, wait a minute. I don't see any Russian troops on the Mexican border, off your coastlines, across the Canada. You know, they're just not there where you are entirely around Russia. I guess I just gave you some stats of how many destroyers are sitting off the Chinese and the Russian border, and you've just amassed them on, but yet you see Russia as aggressive. Well, I guess maybe part of it, maybe you're right in part of it, but part of it is that we have a, a NATO alliance and we have to protect NATO, you know. Uh, Russell. Uh, Worst thing they ever did. Well, but it is an attack on one country is an attack on all. So, um, are you suggesting that if they're if they're concerned about Russian aggression, which they've had reasons to be, that we should not be going there? It just happens to be next to Russia. I agree, but that's where NATO is. Um, so, should we not pick and choose those areas and uh, uh, put our troops in Canada? Wow, Rhea, it's all no, yours. They- I don't believe that you need to go around the world policing everything. And I see NATO as another acronym for the US. And like you're seeing at the minute, or the world, as the world looks into your political circus, you've just got a load of finger pointing. It wasn't us, it was them. It wasn't them, it was, you know, it was just loads of it. And when no one person stands up and takes responsibility for an action that's about to be taken, when the innocent civilians, men, women and children get slaughtered and you lay the ground to waste everybody will just start pointing the fingers at everybody else so therefore how do you do it you look at history look at iraq and the weapons of mass destruction we took a point of trust there it was a disaster look where you've laid waste to libya you've laid waste to iraq you've laid waste to afghanistan i could just go on and on and on Oh, well, I, I, I would agree with you on those four, actually. Well, the only well, thing I wouldn't how, agree with Afghanistan because we were attacked from Al-Qaeda from there, and, and there had to be a response. But the other three, I would a agree. It's trading center. It's just, it was all about the opium. Nah, uh, listen. Oh, uh, I know you don't see it like that. Anyway, okay. let's move but, on. But, but I would agree with, but, but Rhea, I would agree with, you know, Libya and, and, and you know, the Syria and, and things like that. I, I would agree uh uh, Iraq not going in there, and that was basically the Bush administration being neocons. But I, I understand what you're saying. Um, listen, it's a good debate. You haven't got form. You haven't got good form. And in the and po- the court of public opinion, it, it they don't see it how you do. I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna to- you know what? I'm gonna look into it more how the U, uh, how the Europeans, especially the Western Europeans. I think the Eastern Europeans are behind us. I want to see about the Western Europeans, and I'm going to get back on the next show what their viewpoints. Are. It's not that I don't believe you. I want to I want to do my own research because I want to be really informed how if they are more concerned about the United States military build up than the Russian build up. And I think that's fascinating because I'm not aware of it. So you got me into some research, and I thank you. Well, <laughs> no, the point is you're going to get different points of view depending on who you speak to. So if you speak to people that are pro um, NATO and the US, they're going to be all for it. But if you get down on at the street level, where the people are, are next to where all these weapons that you're loading in, that they're going to say something else different. What, what, how would you feel if a tanks are rolling by your apartment in Manhattan? Wow. Well, if Russia was next door, I'd feel very comfortable with it. 
if they weren't, I would be uncomfortable. If Russia was in New Jersey, I'm making this up, I'd feel very like, oh, thank God. So I'm being honest. Would, would you feel that? If Russia was in New Jersey, Dean, and we felt uncomfortable because they just happened to be there, wouldn't you feel comfortable with a few tanks on Madison Avenue? Very uncomfortable. No, no. Uncomfortable? Very uncomfortable. I'd feel comfortable. No, Russia's in New Jersey. Right. Wouldn't you want a few tanks, American tanks, on Madison Avenue rather than no tanks? Absolutely. Okay, so... Right, Absolutely. You that I'd, that okay. I'd want. Okay, so uh, that analogy, I'm not quite sure, stands, Rhea. Um, but the point is, is none of it's going anywhere good, is it? No. And we have to have a change of thought process. And I agree. I agree. Uh, we should have a new thought. But we certainly um, cannot continue the situation with uh, Russia meddling in our elections and doing these things. There has to be a price to be paid. Okay, and I've got some audio on that for you, Scott. But the, the, the point is, is um, I, I think you feel differently. I mean, when when you go well i think we should do this and i think we should do that you don't feel personally under attack that's, it's not on your shores that's and that's correct. the point you're right no but yet you're calling russia the aggressor so this in itself doesn't add up if if russia was just around the corner from you i would get what you were saying but they're not no, the, the okay. people that are going, oh, we should do this and we should do that. There are no consequences. There are no Americans that are going to be laid to waste. It's going to be us lot over here. So then why don't we just uh, eliminate NATO? Call it a day. No, 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 no. It's, it's a point of view, isn't it? It's to understand history and where your military goes. If somebody blinks and it goes off, innocent people are dead. The point is... Is it's not you don't feel that that's you and you would feel different if they were mounting on your borders to when someone from the other side of the world says, well, I think we should do this. And I think there's no consequences for you, is there? No. So let's let's uh, pause that because I, I like to get into that a little bit more in another show. But I have one last question. What about uh, North Korea saying they have ICBMs right now that they could put a nuclear warhead, whether they're bluffing or not? We need to take it seriously. They're not next door in New Jersey, but they are a threat. Don't you think the United States presence should be strong over there or influencing China? on that situation i don't understand why you guys can have a massively massive military and other people can't hmm. well they're pre we are concerned that uh this nut kim oh young whatever his name is with a haircut um could just uh launch a missile and destroy san francisco right now um but you guys can do that I know, but we're not going to. We're, we're, I think you, you would agree. Yeah, we're we're mentally rough. sane, and this guy is insane. Come on, Rhea. Okay, no, 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 that, no, 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 no. You're using the basis of uh, character assassination for rights on nuclear weapons. That's a nowhere thing. The fact is that you hold the biggest military in the world, but apparently that's okay. But if anybody starts to step up and starts to want their own military... You don't like it. They're nuts. They they live in a different world and they're insane. They may be, they may not be, but it's not the grounds for going in and policing the world, Scott. Okay, so what you're saying is because we are the military power of the world, other people have the right to defend themselves or protect themselves from our possible change of heart and, and how we see the world, and, and they have those, those same rights. So just, be, uh, you know... W w we're not God, we're not Lord, and therefore you give them the same rights to defend themselves no matter what the precursors are or the threats are. That's really what you're saying, and, and, and I think what you're saying is the way to bring this all down is by us reducing our military presence, but then taking the chance that these other countries will do the same. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that... What gives you the right to have all these weapons? You, America's like the kid in the playground with the biggest stick. And if he goes around using that stick or threatening with that stick, he would be called a bully. Well, let me ask you it's, something. Let me it's ask you, simple. Sure, but let me ask you something. During World War II, weren't you pleased that we were the ones with the biggest stick? No, not really. I mean, World War II was one on two main background. One was down to a guy named Alan Turing. You know who Alan Turing is? No, he sounds like an accountant from Hop Hog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
I don't know if Rhea knows where Hot Bog Long Island is. So. It was an inside joke, Rhea, but no, I haven't heard. <laughs> hey, look, it is an inside joke. You just made yourself look incredibly stupid. But <laughs> <laughs> no, Dean laughed. Maybe the listeners will. Some listeners will enjoy that in the from the area, but definitely someone from hey, your area. I will. love. I, hey, listen. You uh, I, I knew when uh, when I launched my show and the uh, personalities that were involved: Scott Morell, Rhea Bo, and Rhea being in the UK and how worldly you are, Rhea. I love you and uh, politically and uh, just everything. It's uh, you're you're incredible, and I'm I'm sitting back and I'm yeah. I'm just listening, to you guys. And uh, this is this is a great show. I think it's, you know uh, I think it's really I think it's really cool and healthy that uh, this discussion I'm listening to you guys with. And I want to I want to conclude. I know we're running up against the clock, and I want to conclude that I think you and I, Rhea, have a very healthy dialogue. I love your point of view. I do respect it. Um, I hope you respect my point of view also, and uh, we we uh, disagree without this being disagreeable. And I think we need more of that uh, discussion because people need to see both sides of the coin. And uh, I think this was really good. I think we really exchanged good points of view. I hope you feel the same way. I do. It's always amazing to listen to you. And I think, what? <laughs> I just gave you a compliment. I, I, yeah, I just got a I do, dick. I, do, I, <laughs> I was just so I nice. I do agree with a statement that Scott made uh, just a couple of minutes ago, Rhea, that I understood, okay, is the guy with the crazy haircut in Korea. Yes. You know, the whack job? Yes. You use the word whack job, yes, right? Yes, of course. And you mentioned to us that we're sane. Yes, I'll okay. compare to him. So I understand that in that. Right. <laughs> 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 and she, I, I, and she's I, saying we should I, just. Uh, I get that analogy yeah. that we're we're sane, but uh, I guess other people maybe don't think we're sane. Okay? Yeah, but compared to him, we should but just give a, up our, our. Yeah, he's a whack job. Yeah, we need to protect ourselves. Okay. Listen, we're gonna we're gonna deal with this another time. But we could go on for you yeah. guys. You guys could go on for hours on that. But you know uh, what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do some more research and on some of the things that Rhea uh, made statements about, um, and I'm going to um, you know retort and and do a friendly challenge with her. I think it's great. Okay, I think it's great. Uh, Rhea, hey, do you have do you have anything like? else that you want to say, Rhea? Without yeah, insulting I mean, me. I'm not going to insult you. I mean, the the the, the not knowing the knowing that you sort of saved the day in World War Two is a little bit comical. But I'm not going to insult you. Do you know what I mean? That's not the aim at all. But check out Alan Turing and who he was and what he played in that Second World War. It's it's an amazing story. I'm writing but, it but, down, Scott. This isn't Alan this isn't your accountant in Hot Pog Long. <laughs> You want to charge us three fifteen an hour now? Uh, Alan, how do you spell the last name, Ria? Just, just how you say it, Alan Turin. Got it. Okay. And, but anyway, so we, we just flash through a bit more bits of the news because we're nearly there and we've yes, done quite we are, a bit of time yes. anyway. Regarding the Russian hacking that is everywhere, and I, I wanted to bring a point up this now because he's been to a meeting as in in front of the house. And it turns out that um, I'm curious. So this company that uh, the so-called alleged Russian hack came from um, was sourced by a company called CrowdStrike, yes? Yes, that's correct. We understand this now. It's a bit more common knowledge than when I brought it up. So do you know anything about CrowdStrike? Um, no. Um, is it... Um... No. Is that when you invest money into a company, or am I missing that? No, 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 okay. no. No, no that, that's actually a company. Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, right. Okay. The point is, right, so you was doing the 17 intelligence agencies thing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that, your uh, basis for your argument was 17 agencies have said X, Y, and Z about the Russians. And I said, Woo, wait a minute, it turns out it didn't come from there. It came from a private company called CrowdStrike which was then put into a document, and I read the disclaimer out to you, didn't I? Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. Yes. You sure? You're not sounding confident. No, no. I, right. I, yes, yes. Here's a question for you, okay? We now know, since it's been in front of the house, Mr. the director Clapper turns out, he says, and so does the FBI say, that the FBI weren't allowed to look at the servers. Now, this is now f- a fact, so the FBI were forbidden to look at the servers where this hack come from, but CrowdStrike were allowed to use them, which is a private company, okay? So question one, why was the FBI not allowed to look into this, but yet a private company was? What do you think that is, Scott? I don't know. 
I don't know. It's a good question, though, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you agree? Well, CrowdStrike turns out it's owned by a Russian wow. lobbyist in D.C. <laughs> okay. Right. So isn't that ironic that a, that a Russian lobbyist looking to make noises in D.C. owns CrowdStrike? And they allowed this guy to look at the servers, but they didn't allow the FBI to look at the servers. Well, maybe they well, wanted to hide that from the FBI to continue this covert operation. But why? Why would they want to admit? Do, do you not trust the FBI? Yes, I trust the FBI, but this, this, but, this lobbyist would not want it, that getting out to the FBI, right? It's worth bringing it up, I think, that okay. the FBI were not allowed in this. Right. Uh, well, it seems like they, a- I think you're implying that they asked and this lobbyist said no. No, 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 no. Clapper said no to the FBI. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, Clapper, uh, FBI wanted in oh, to, to, okay. to, to gain something of substance to say, look, the FBI have looked into it. Well, it turned out that the FBI did a report in the Washington, as reported in the Washington Post. Um, it says this, the FBI, which has been investigating Russian hacks of political government, academic and other organizations for several years, privately has concluded the same. But the Bureau has not publicly drawn to the sa- to the link of Russia, GRU. So over a two year span or so, the FBI have been looking into it and can find no links to Russia. And I'd like to play you a quick audio clip. You know, the antivirus uh, people, McCarthy. Yes. McCarthy antivirus. Yes. Well, he deals with malware. You're about to listen to an interview. This is a very short passage of his um, thoughts on the alleged Russian hack. Have a quick listen to this. All right. The technical aspect of this, there's still a lot of generic terminology. Do they, is it not known universally how you find out, how you trace what people are doing in cyberspace? Let me read to you one sentence from this report. The sentence goes, the nature of cyberspace makes attribution of cyber operations difficult, but not impossible. Every kind of cyber operation leaves a trail. They're absolutely correct. What they're missing is that anyone can create that trail. If I'm I'm, uh, the Russian KGB, the trail that I leave is up to me. I can create it. I mean, for example, even if the NSA, as they claim, can trace any spoofed IP, no matter how many servers you want to go through, they claim they can trace it to its source. Well, if I'm the KGB, I have operatives all over the world. When I finish my malware, I mail it to my operative in South Africa and say, go rent uh, a computer at a coffee shop and plant this malware. There's simply no way to, to connect it then with Russia. Mm-hmm. The entire report is based on a trade craft that is 50 years old. I have great respect for our intelligence community. Don't get me wrong. Great respect. I do. But they are behind the times. This is a new age. They cannot possibly be unsophisticated enough not to know that these traces are all created electronically by the hackers. Would you go so far as to say that their behavior is reckless? Well, I wouldn't say reckless. I would say possibly naive, uh, uh, you know, possibly based on the way things used to be before this new cyber age of intelligent and creative hackers Mm -hmm. came into being. The report further goes on to say, we can trace them by the way they do their work and the specific malware that they use. This is also nonsense. Once a piece of malware has been used, it ends up in the dark web and hundreds of thousands of hackers are now using that. They're ignoring this one important point. Just because someone uses a piece of malware does not mean it was the malware's creator or anyone related to them. Your thoughts on piece of malware get your thoughts on the FBI not having access directly to the servers and yet coming to a conclusion and outsourcing it to a company that they claim is reputable. 
<laughs> well, it does, to me, it doesn't matter. We do know the facts. We know the malware that was used. Yeah. We know that the fact it had Russian language in it. Uh, we know all of these things that could not possibly be there if it were really the Russians. So whether they had access to the server or not, common sense tells you, just based on public knowledge, that it cannot possibly be the Russian government. Now, it may be a Russian, could be a 15-year-old kid using the same malware, or it could be some criminal hacking organization, but certainly not the KGB, certainly not the Russian intelligence services. This is way too unsophisticated, All right. too crude, John McAfee, too many errors. Great for your expertise tonight. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. There you go, guys. What do you make of that? I, I, I can tell you what I make of that. I believe that we're not privy to the, all the intelligence that was uh, disclosed to uh, President Obama and President Trump and the eight, the gang of eight in uh, in Congress. And I believe there's more to it. I believe it's not only evidence of tracing the hacking, but I think there's an element of human intelligence that has uh, reconfirmed it. And I don't think we know about that because they're not going to give up their um, sources and methods. So I understand what you're saying, but that's a one-dimensional look at it. And it's prob- it could be correct. I'm not saying it, but I don't think they're... I, I think our intelligence is pretty pretty sophisticated. I believe they have multiple ways of figuring it out, but we won't know that. Okay. okay. On, that, on that note, uh, we're getting uh, up to one hour and 15 minutes on this show. Rhea, do you have anything else, uh, Scott, before I uh, close the show out with something that I want to talk about? I think Rhea should have um, a cup of hot tea with a dash of arsenic today. <laughs> I get that. That's okay. I love you, Rhea. I know one I thing. Know I, I know one thing that I'm going to say that uh, I want to share with you. What I experienced yesterday is Scott. I wish uh, with your mannerisms today. I wish. Uh, I wish you knew how to do Facebook Live. Have you ever experienced Facebook Live before? No, I'm not really aware of it. How about Ria? Have you ever experienced uh, Facebook Live? Uh, no, no, I haven't. I sort of know how it works, but I no, I haven't. Well, I don't know how it works, but uh, <laughs> let me just share this story uh, that took place yesterday with a uh, featured guest that was just uh, fabulous, uh, a Dr. Uh, Faith Brown, uh, founder of uh, the Brown Wellness Group in New York City. She's a clinical psychologist, and we met a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she was supposed to be a guest yesterday remotely. And at the last minute on a day before, she decided to clear her calendar and decided to, from New Jersey, drive out early in the morning and uh, and be in the studio here for the show. Uh, it was just an incredible experience because I had a chance. I, I didn't know, all of a sudden I walked into, she said, you know what, we're gonna, you're gonna get your first experience of Facebook Live. And she came in with equipment and she came in with a, a stand that, that was right there in the corner, Scott. Um, she put her iPhone on that stand. She had, uh, once again, a gadget, a remote control. She sat exactly where you're sitting. She had a, a, a tiny laptop right next to her here. And uh, I was on TV for the first time, Facebook Live. It was just uh, remarkable. You know, I thought it was, I thought she was, you know, I said to her, I said, Dr. Brown, are you telling me that we're just going to do a pre-show marketing uh, and, and say hello to everybody? I mean, she says, no, we're going to... Uh, we're going to do uh, we're going to do an entire show as Facebook Live. I think uh, last time last time I saw I think within the hour there were there were like seven hundred views coming in at ten o'clock a.m. in the morning watching our show at a time when people are at work. There were so many views from all over coming in. So how do they us. how do well, they how do they know when it's on? You just put it on. What's the warning? We had uh, yeah. We just uh, she started on her drive out saying uh, posting things on her Instagram oh, that, that, and that, whatever at, at a certain look time. For, look okay. for I'm going to be hanging out with Dean Blackman in the Dean Blackman Show okay. studio. So you get and some I'm going to be on Face Facebook Live, okay. but it was all done at the last minute. Could it be? Uh, is it saved by the way, or it's just live? Yes, you can go to oh, you can go to Dean Blackman on Facebook. Uh, and uh, it'll it, that's it, great. It's on there that you can Excellent. see uh, Facebook Live, and uh, it was just an incredible experience. So that's great. I didn't know if you've ever experienced it no. because 
your mannerisms today <laughs> with what we were the would have, show this would have been, been perfect yes, so we've yes. got to find a way to someone's got to learn scott you've got to learn how to do yeah uh, you got to learn how to do facebook live because yeah, but, it looked it looked pretty simple and uh right now you can go to it on dean blackman facebook and it's uh it's uh right there to be seen uh, it's constantly up there and the show is also archived as number 50 on uh, youtube the dean blackman show youtube and on itunes and as well as uh, the dean blackman website but as of yesterday even before it got archived later on onto youtube and to itunes and to the website People were seeing it at 10 a.m. That's phenomenal. Live in action here. I mean, it's Facebook Live hasn't been going on. Ria, how long's Facebook Live? Uh, do you know how long it's been uh, available? Um, it's been around for around maybe six, eight months. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm going to look Scott. into it. You know, so you got to you got to view it. Uh, I'm going to. And she. I mean, my heart, she, we had a, just a great, she's she's the most, uh, Dr. Faith, but the most high energy person I've ever met in my life. And uh, congratulations at the, on at that the, interview. At the, at the end, she had, uh, she set me up. Uh, she really set me up. She said, uh, now before we close, and we weren't, a, we had to eliminate it uh, because you couldn't, uh, we took the uh, headphones off. So you couldn't have this on an archive podcasted uh, audio. Uh, Boris had to delete it, but on the face on the Facebook Live, Live, she insisted she started playing uh, one of these songs. Maybe Rhea knows she's the expertise out of all of us on music. There's, yes. a, there's a hit song, uh, very upbeat by Tim, uh, Justin Timberlake, uh, that she played. Mm -hmm. And she says, Dean, before the show ends, you got to get up and you got to dance. Oh, with my God. Me. <laughs> so, uh, so I did that with her for, for like 20 seconds. Oh, uh, before. That's, a, that's a sight for sore eyes. But this technology of, you know, we're talking about gadgets that we started off this show with. Scott, this, yeah. So this Facebook line. I'm going to look into a team. We have to, uh, someone, uh, someone's got to take charge and, uh, I'm going to work on it and become the expert. We, we should be, we should be setting that up. I'm Each, gonna, every show of ours, gonna, we should be doing Facebook live. You know, the only thing that I would say is I wish we did it today because if Rhea could have seen my reactions to her answers, my eyebrows going up, my shaking of the head, my sour face. Um, I think she would have appreciated it even more in the audience also. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, Scott, but if you, you know why else? and I think Rhea is going to appreciate that I make this statement at the end. You should listen to that Facebook Live of that show. Oh, with, definitely. Uh, Dr. She's an incredible woman. She offered, I think she offered for the first 25 people that respond from that show, that instead of uh, you being charged a $500 free consultation, you'll get a $90 consultation. Can I still you do might it? Want to take her up on that. I, how do I do it? And a free book. How do I do it? You got to listen listen to the show. And then what? Go to Facebook Live and she gives an address to contact her. I'm doing it on the way and home. And you should meet her. And I think you'd be a per Rhea, do you agree with me that Scott would be a perfect candidate for Dr. Brown to sit in her chair? Of course she is. As, I, 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 I'm the one with at, the issues. Instead of a $500 consultation, he'll get a discount of $99 if he's one of the first 25 to respond. I would love to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> I'm sure you would. Um, and I think she would agree that I would be a perfect um, uh, subject for that uh, therapy. So going back to the beginning of our show of gadgets, I think this whole Facebook Live phenomenon is incredible. Is that more technology than gadgets? Yeah, it okay. is. But, it but, is. But, but I like how you're closing it. Okay, also I want to close. I got a great guest coming on uh, this Friday. I don't know if you remember, for eight seasons, there was a hit show called Dexter on. Of course. Do you remember Dexter? Of course. I got a great actress. But I, but I only watched it three times. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, 19-year-old lady, a 19-year-old uh, young lady, great lady, uh, Christina Robinson. She was best known for uh, the role Aster Bennett on the show, on the uh, blockbuster show Dexter. She's going to be on the show later in the week. I'm very excited about it. As you know, I love to do these uh, younger generation of shows that uh, Skype we, or we want to do. She's going to be on remote uh, okay. from Hollywood Good. she'll be on but uh, that's great she called me uh, she called me earlier in the week heard about the show very excited about it and uh, asked if she could uh, asked if she could come on so uh, more details will follow but uh, in the next couple of days uh, Christina Robinson I'll be writing uh, about that Congratulations. super super just a great lady there's been some posts on Facebook and LinkedIn uh, today uh, just a just a great success story you're gonna hear a lot about her congratulations on that get
Thank that's you. That's a good one. That Dexter uh, was unbelievable for eight seasons. Yeah, it was a hit. Okay. So on that note, uh, I thought today was a great show, guys. Yeah, we didn't know where it was going to go. I think it went great. As I always do, let's start with uh, Rhea. Rhea, anything else that you want to say in closing? No, I think it was the show of sort of, we started out with just gadgets, but because of time restraints, your end it ended up going into sort of what was a fairly unprepared news, my end, which was going to be done tomorrow, um, on topics that were pointed out, uh, the farmer problem, uh, you can get the Monsanto video on Wicked Vid, and if you want to check out the US's um, strategic place within the opium trade, on Afghanistan, which was also something I said, you can check out a guy named John Pilja who did a, a documentary on it. So it's it's worth a look to make your own minds up. But other than that, love and peace to everybody. Rhea, I just want to say that uh, you did a heck of a job today. Not a job. You just did a great, it was a great show. And I love you for it. Appreciate it. Have tremendous respect for you. And uh, it was just uh, listening to you is always, always a pleasure and educational. And I and I thank you, especially I, I know what it's like to do when you're you, you, you uh, when you're under the weather. I have been under the weather. God, I'll tell you the way it went. I had a sore throat at two o'clock on a Saturday and by nine, 10 p.m., I was in bed and in bed for the next 48 hours because I couldn't lift my head. So I'm pleased to be able to be here today and and um, converse with my lovely Scott. You know that you know that I wouldn't be able to do what you did today, Rhea. You know that I get cranky. Yeah, no, I'm a little bit cranky, aren't I? I've turned it up a little bit on Scott. So yes, you did. I love you, though, Scott. Going I'll... back to Scott. Scott, do you have anything that you want to close with? Yes, uh, I'm much weaker than Rhea when I stub my toe on the coffee table. I'm out of it for like a few days. So um, I don't have that kind of stamina with illness. Um, but besides that, I think this was a great show in Rhea. Um, I love uh, your point of view. I don't agree with uh, some or most of it, but that was, that's what makes this show so interesting. We could uh, air it out and have our listeners decide, and I think that's great. Okay, in closing, I just want to say, as always, uh, don't forget uh, to like us on Facebook and to hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you'd like to leave a comment, uh, use the box below. The last couple of months, uh, all our previous shows, including this one, are all podcasted and archived on our website, as well as uh, YouTube and and uh, iTunes. So if you'd like to share your story and any ideas and be a guest on the show, go to DeanBleckman.com and email me directly. I would like to thank all my listeners for being with us today. From all of us at The Dean Blackman Show, have a great day. You've been listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.